It shows my age, it shows your age too. Because <laughs> like fossils, we're all aging at about the same rate. So uh, it's great to be here. It's been a few years since I've been able to be on the lectureship, but uh, I try to attend every year and cer certainly enjoy it. And uh, the book is a great resource. I've been using the book of Acts as I'm preaching through the book of Acts back in Pickerington this year and uh, using last year's lectureship book. And so it's been a great resource. Uh, the church there sends their love to you. And, and uh, I'm glad to be on first thing Monday morning. That way we can get this over and get onto the good stuff, right? Because the answer to the question is the flood was global. So I could sit down and spare you, you know, but I'd have to spare you some good details and some interesting things. I don't want to do that. I'd like to share some of those things with you because really this lecture is not about what the Bible says, was it global or local? It's going to be part of it. It's needful that we discuss that, actually, so that we can clear up any confusion as far as interpretation. But the, the lectures, all of them, this one included, are really about the integrity of the Bible, aren't they? This is about a defense of the first part of Genesis that has fallen under extreme criticism and attack more and more in recent years and so there's definitely a need for a treatment of this subject as well as all of the other ones that were well picked and well thought out in the lecture series we need to be able to stand unashamed of the book that we hold dear to us josh prayed just a little bit ago that god's book promised salvation you know, and if we, if we doubt the flood, then we have to doubt the promise of salvation, right? I mean, how could we pray for such if, if one great doctrine in the Bible, such as Genesis and, and the, the flood narrative, is in error, then I'm going to have to also doubt that the promise of God unto, unto eternal life is, is true. And so really, these are all tied together. It's very important for me and for you to have confidence to stand with God's word in light of all the scrutiny and be able to be proud to say, I believe this word. The Bible records in Genesis 6 through 9, and if you want to turn there, we'll make some references throughout the lectures. In Genesis 6 through 9, though, uh, it records of a great flood which occurred during the days of a man named Noah. And with the exception of perhaps the creation count of Genesis 1 through 3, and the life and redemptive work of Jesus Christ, the flood account has created more controversy than perhaps any other narrative in the sacred writings. It's not simply been ignored, but rather has become a lightning rod of sustained, well-developed attacks, concentrated attacks by many modern geologists and anthropologists in the fields of science who vehemently rebuke the notion that the global flood occurred as stated in the book of Genesis. Many theologians then have followed suit under that pressure uh, to conform. Uh, many have become skeptical over the Bible's record of divine intervention at the time of Noah to bring about this catastrophe. And such skepticism, I believe, has probably even crept into the minds of many in the Lord's church. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes it's just in the heart. Sometimes that seed of doubt is planted. Many of our young people, it's planted daily in the public schools. I know my daughter's biology book uh, this year, she's a junior in high school, devotes the preface, the introduction, and the first chapter to evolution and specifically wants to weed out the notion that creation could have occurred. And so we have to have long talks with our children before any of the classes in a public school are taught. And if they're going to go to a college of any setting, they need to be aware of the different uh, arguments that are made against God's word and also the ones that are for God's word. God's word not being the least of the greatest arguments for the validity of the Bible. But let's establish this that Bible-believing Christians do not have a quarrel with geologic science. 
it is against the uniformitarian, and I'll define that, the uniformitarian geologists that we've taken a stand who have based their understanding of geologic history on the assumption of uniformitarianism. According to Dr. John Whitcomb and Dr. Henry Morris, who are uh, well-versed uh, men in this work throughout the years, in their distinguished work on the Genesis flood, they defined it as this, uniformitarianism. That takes a lot of practice just to say that, and you don't have to. You can just read it. Uniformitarianism is the belief that present existing physical processes account for all past changes and for the present state of the universe, denying the possibility of any miraculous suspension or alteration of those processes by their creator. So what you see now going on around you, going on around you has always been the way it has happened. This is natural processes have brought all of these things about. The doctrine of a bib biblical flood then, of course, asserts that at least on the occasions mentioned in Scripture, God has directly intervened in the normal processes of the universe, causing significant changes to the earth. And so there's the contrast between the two. By and large, the doctrine of divine intervention has been thrown under the bus by the scientific community, primarily because it poses a threat to the doctrine of evolution, which is the crown jewel of uniformitarianism, that is, natural causes. No creator, naturalism. And so the idea of a creator bringing it about, let alone intervening throughout history, stands in direct opposition. So these two things do contrast sharply. And though we'll be limited here to, in presenting all the evidence for and against a global flood, the following I hope will give you an adequate framework for understanding the debate, which is still a hot topic in many forms and for concluding that the flood as recorded in Genesis did occur and that it was global in nature. It's my hope, really, that whether you're someone here today or you're listening in the future somewhere, driving down the road with a CD and a player, I hope that it will create a foundation or a stronger foundation of faith by which then we'll continue to seek God and ultimately a soul or souls will be saved from the lecture, from this evidence. I know Christian evidences have played a great role in solidifying my own faith. I've had to go back to those and start there in building faith in many different times in my life. When I'm challenged, I go back to that foundation and build again. I hope that that happens as a result of this. But why does it matter whether the flood was global or local? What's the big deal? Why, why can't we just say, well, maybe it was local? Well, in short, the answer is this. Many in the scientific community have staked their life's research, not to mention their very lives, on a uniformitarian or evolutionary understanding of historical geology. There are, this kind of reminds me of perhaps why the, the Jewish leadership fought Jesus the apostles so vehemently. There's more at stake here than just a, a doctrinal understanding. There's lives, lifestyles, there's livelihood, all at stake. These scientists are funded to research these particular things with expected outcomes. So there's a direct confrontation to someone's livelihood and life's research when you start introducing the idea of a creation and a flood. It's personal, it's very personal. I know that from experience by being on a university campus for 12 years, that the scientific community there took it very personal whenever their theories were challenged, as a theory even, because it's uh, to be accepted as fact. And so there's something personally at stake. Dr. Henry Morris summarized in general that the geologic ages concept, the ages, the long amount of time it took to bring everything about, he says the geologic ages concept and a worldwide devastating flood logically cannot coexist. 
And I believe that that's true, just like I believe that you cannot accept both creation and evolution as defined, uh, macroevolution, that is, as defined as such. It's one or the other. Morris captured also the importance of the debate in one paragraph when he said, the entire structure of evolutionary historical geology, the entire structure of it, rests squarely upon the assumption of uniform, uniformity and the scientific basis of the theory of evolution is almost entirely grounded on the testimony of their historic geology. And in turn, the theory of evolution has been made the basis of all of the godless philosophies that are plaguing the world today, and in particular, is the spearhead of attack against biblical Christianity. And I think that he's right on the money with that. Ultimately, the integrity of the Bible and the credibility of an individual's faith in the Bible stands or falls with the validity of the flood account as well as other accounts. And in turn, an individual's soul will stand or fall with it. Was the flood global or local? That all of the earth's land mass was once completely covered in water is not in question. Even the highest mountains of earth among them Mount Everest, 29,035 feet, are found to consist of limestone beds of marine fossils. In my own experience, in recent years, since I've kind of had an eye for these types of things and studying, I've come across many fossils, marine fossils, that I have found on the tops of high hills in Appalachia, West Virginia, Ohio, and even on over into Indiana. Now, I I did uh, give one to Jeff, and you can pass that around if you want to look at it. I found that this August in Indiana, and who's your national forest? And the elevation I could not find for you, but it's at least 1,000 feet, probably a little higher. It was on a high ridge. There was a steep valley in the middle. And those fossils would have had a long climb, those seashells, with no legs, to get up to the top of that hill. So they were carried there, and... Whatever your interpretation of that might be, it was, that hill was covered with water at one point in history. And I have come to find recently that many of the rocks that I have been passing by in my ventures in the outdoors are just such rocks. One place where I like to hunt, I get up on this rock up on the top of a hill, I stand on the rock. I've done that for years. And I finally, I looked down at it here just a couple years ago and there, sure enough, there were seashell fossils embedded in that thing. It's fascinating to me, but it's, you know, the, the evidence is, is there. That's not the point of contention. That's not the point of contention. There are fossils like this all over. The debate is whether the earth was completely covered as a result of the flood recorded in Genesis chapter 6 through 9. That's the debate. Was this a result of this Noahic flood that we read about in the Bible and men scamper to try to avoid that question as they also try to interpret the geologic column that we're going to talk about in a little bit. But I do believe that it was orchestrated supernaturally. Dr. John D. Morris, there's a lot of Morrises I'm going to quote here, several. Dr. John D. Morris describes the nature of the flood when he says, we now know, of course, that the earth has plenty of water to launch a global flood. So could it occur now? let alone without these windows of heaven uh, opening up and these floodgates of the deep breaking open. What do we have now? Well, if you flattened all of the earth's surface, took all the mountains and pushed them down, took all those deep ocean basins and lifted up, just kind of made it where everything was flat like Texas, all around the globe, water would stand above the land masses over 8,000 feet. That's pretty deep. There's plenty of water to cover. But why has it been shifted around? It's another question. But the key to remember is that the uh, flood did not have to cover the present earth as it is now. You know, when I was growing up, I always thought that was the, that was the deal. That, well, what we see now, these are the mountains that were covered. That's not necessarily the case. Because when you read the nature of this thing, and you read the deeps being broken open, you realize that the earth was really going through a turbulent time at the command of God to break it open and to dump water from the heavens down upon it. The earth changed. 
dramatically. That flood accomplished a lot of geologic work, eroding sediments over here, and redepositing them over here, pushing up continents, elevating plateaus, wiping out terrains, so that the earth is very, very different than it was before. Now, what does the Bible say? I mean, we can admit that there are changes that have taken place. We can see evidence that water was on the earth at one time, covering the highest hills even that we have today. So let's start first and look at what, what does the Bible say about the flood? Is it, is it consistent? Is it uniform in its testimony that the flood was, first of all, a historic fact? That it was global in nature? It matters for several reasons, of course, because we can find a contradiction in the Bible. That's going to, it's going to say something to our case. But there is no contradiction. And if the Bible doesn't claim that the flood was global, then there's no point in defending it as such. But the Bible gives more detail about this catastrophe than any other ancient source that writes about a cataclysmic flood. And there are a lot of sources we'll talk about in a minute. And thirdly, the Bible cannot be discredited by an elite as an invalid book of history as archaeologists are finding the Bible to be increasingly valuable as a guide to the past more and more as we dig things up. And so this idea that you can just wave the hand and say, well, the Bible record, of course, we know that that's not valid. Is we understand that if you take a serious look at it, it becomes very serious very quickly how accurate it is. But as time goes on, we have time on our side. Time is on our side because we just keep digging up evidence of what the Bible has already recorded. And the Bible records that the flood was global. All biblical writers who refer to the flood uphold it as an historical event. They don't apologize for it. They don't pass it off as allegorical. It was accepted at that time, over those 1,500 years or so, as fact Guy Ann Woods remarked this about it. He said, the scriptures in the most detailed fashion tell us when it began and ended, how long it continued, and why it came. In no other matters, he says, are the sacred writings more minute regarding the events described. And there is a lot about the flood in the Bible. Let's look first into what the account of Genesis 6 through 9 affirms. You can go ahead and take a look into your scriptures here. Look about in verse 7 of Genesis chapter 6. In these four chapters, 6 through 9, which contain 97 verses, there are no less than 59 references, that's a great majority of those passages, that are made to the universality of the flood, the, that it, it was global in nature. Words such as all, every, whole, are used to describe the earth and its inhabitants which succumbed to the deluge. In Genesis 6-7, God grieved that he had made man and disclosed his intention to destroy man and beast, creeping things, and birds of the air, quote, from the face of the earth. In, in chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, we read, quote, so God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt, and all flesh, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Sounds like he's talking about the whole thing to me, doesn't it? Yeah. And it just, it's four chapters of that. 57 of the 90, or 59 of the 97 verses refer, uh, talk in such language. All flesh had become corrupt, and the end of all flesh was in view, as well as the destruction of the earth. And in order to bring this about, he said, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Those ocean basins. And the windows of heaven were opened. In chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. And in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 7, we read, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. No apologies here. You know, it wasn't a lot of rain. The waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward from there, and the mountains were covered. 
Well, it's not hard to imagine how the release of water from beneath the ocean floors, coupled with an outpouring of water from the heavens, would have a global impact. I always enjoyed the work of Apologetics Press where they, where they uh, uh, formulated a, a hypothesis that if the draft of the ark was one half its height, which is still a, a formula used for naval shipbuilding today, the draft of the, of the boat, that is how far it would set down into the water when placed in the water after dry docking it and building it. The draft of the ark was half of its height, that it comes out to 15 cubits. You ever notice that? It was 30 cubits high. And the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward over the highest mountain. I always enjoyed that. It's like God covered it high enough to where if that ark just so happened to cover, to go across the top of the highest mountain out there, and just skip it. Just get it up there and get it over the top. That's wonderful. That's one of those hidden gems. You, know, you don't get in the initial reading of the book. But God did everything intentionally here. In the Old Testament, aside from the Genesis account, the flood is mentioned in Job 12, 15, where he said, if he withholds the waters, they dry up. If he sends them out, they overwhelm the earth. Sounds like he had some experience with that, at least in stories that were passed down to him, doesn't it? The psalmist also remarks, the Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits at king, as king forever in Psalm 29.10. There are other references. 104.5-9 is a great reference. Now, New Testament writers allude to the first 11 chapters of Genesis no less than seven times. New Testament writers refer to this lectureship topic, Genesis 1 through 11, 70 times, and six of these validate the historicity and universality of the Noahic flood. In a context of world judgment, the Lord said, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 37 through 39, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood... They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Global in its reach. It's analogous to the judgment day where we don't have any qualms about understanding that the Lord will come back and when he shouts with that voice, all who are in the graves will come forth, John 5. The same Lord says it's going to be kind of like that in some ways. It's going to take people off guard, be ready. Looking forward to some of the other lectures that deal with that. Adam Blaney's dealing with this relationship of the salvation of Noah to the salvation of New Testament Christianity. So it's going to be exciting week to study these things. According to Peter, then, the extent of the flood was directly related to the reason for the flood. So the reasons were the same for the flood and for the judgment day, and that was sin. Sin was a universal problem in the days of Noah, overcoming all but those eight who were faithful to God and whom God preserved in the ark. And sin's a universal problem today, isn't it? Boy, it is. And it'll culminate in a global judgment. In presenting a warning to his listeners of an impending universal judgment, Peter said that mockers will come in the last day. I think they're here, don't you? I think they're here. They've been here for a little while, and they'll probably continue right on until that day. Now, he knew. He faced a little bit of it himself early on, before Peter's passing. They're already mocking Jesus' return. It's like they were mocking Noah for building an ark, expecting something he had never seen before. And he goes on to say that they, they'll make comments like, where's the promise of his coming? Where is he? He said, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That's 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. 
Peter then reminded them of what they willfully wanted to forget, and that was the flood story. So Peter pulls this up to uh, validate the judgment. He pulls up the flood to validate the judgment. Imagine that. You know, here we are talking about validating the flood. Peter says, oh, let me take something that's a known fact and validate something that hasn't happened yet. He said they willfully forget this, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing in water and out of water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. They forgot about that. Second Peter 3, 5 through 7. He argued that the things that have not continued, he argued that things had not continued as they were from the beginning. So the mockers said, Where, where's the promise of his coming? All things continue on as they have been. Doesn't that sound like that definition? Of that big long word that we set out at the beginning of the lectureship. Uniformitarianism. What you see now is the way it's always been, relatively speaking, some catastrophes mixed in. But there hasn't been any universal judgment by a flood. Any divine intervention. It's the present is the key to the, have you heard that? To the past. That's their motto. The present what we see uh, in, in geology today and how things are working together out there in the, in the earth. That's the way it's always been. And uh, it's been this way from the creation, from the beginning. And Peter said, no, it's not. No, it's not been that way from the beginning. There's been an intervention that wiped out every living thing on the earth. There's been an abrupt change in earth's history well, what was the world that existed then like? We're not really sure. We might have some hints of it. Peter made a distinction between the two worlds, pre-flood and post-flood, which is a clue to the massive destruction the flood brought upon the earth's surface and to the evidence of a very different world in ancient times. Peter speaks of it being uh, uh, the earth being destroyed by a cataclyso, the Greek term, a cataclysm. A deluge, which carries the meaning to wash down. The earth was washed down. You've heard of a shakedown, right? This is a wash down. The heavens and the earth shook in this great event. He then draws the analogy to the day of judgment by saying, The heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, the same word that issued forth the waters to cover all the earth by that same word the same word you can read about was it Hebrews 1 2 he upholds all things by the power of his word issued forth the flood now he upholds all things and by the same word again in the future the world is reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men 2 Peter 3 7 and 8 this point's plain. Like the earth was destroyed once in judgment by water, be destroyed again in judgment by fire. Be ready, he says. The Genesis flood serves yet another great purpose, and I don't want to get into someone else's lectureship too deeply who's sitting in the back row back there ready to go tomorrow. But we have to make mention that Peter said that the flood is a type of Christian baptism. That's why it's important. This is why it matters that it was a global cleansing of sin in that day. Okay? Because the effect today of sin is global. And Peter said that there is a type here and an antitype. And the antitype is Christian baptism, which washes away the sins of the world in essence. He said it's analogous to the waters of the Genesis flood. In 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21, this is where he made this statement and explained that Noah and his family were saved through water. I remember, I don't know if it was Charles back there or someone tripped me up one time and said, how was Noah saved? Well, the ark, of course. Well, you know, once you think about it, he could have got on the ark and stayed there a really long time if no water would have come to separate him from the sinful world. Now, there's not much of a salvation sitting at dry dock with people shouting mocking things at you while you're sitting on the boat. And nothing's happening. You really wasn't saved on the ark in, in that sense of, of the word or the meaning of it. He was saved when the water came and lifted him 
apart and above the sinful world. Set him apart, sanctified him. Hmm. Does baptism do that today? Does it wash? Does it separate? Does it sanctify? Does it cleanse? What a wonderful, helpful way to understand what the Lord commanded in his great commission. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit had Peter record that. It helps me understand this a little bit more. That the waters are a symbolic grave separating the believer from the sinful world. You've been lifted up and above. If you're a Christian, you've been lifted up and above and beyond the world. Now, that's not to be taken in a way that makes us arrogant, but appreciative that we've been separated by that watery grave. And Noah's faith and obedience worked together with his salvation, didn't it? And likewise, the believer's faith and obedience are necessary for his salvation. And yet salvation through the flood and salvation today are only possible by the grace of God, which Gene will deal with here soon. Extra biblical evidence for a global flood. Let's talk about some things that are extra biblical outside the Bible. Flood stories are universal. Flood stories. And there's a common thread that runs through them. Though there are many differences that have come down to us through the, through the years. If I told Jeff sitting here in the front row a secret and I said pass this around, you know what would happen by the time it got around the other side, right? It wouldn't quite be the same. It wouldn't be verbatim. As, as when I told him. So as things get passed down, they get changed a little bit. But it's remarkable to note that throughout the world, throughout over a hundred traditions, in the lands of Asia, Australia, the Americas, East Africa, Europe, the East India, and many other places, that these stories have been passed down as truth, having a, having a historical basis. In his classic work, Fossils, Flood, and Fire, Professor Harold W. Clark discussed the fact that flood stories abound in nearly every known culture. He said, preserved in the myths and legends of almost every people on the face of the globe is the memory of a great catastrophe. While myths may not have scientific value, yet they're significant in indicating the fact that an impression was left in the minds of the races of mankind that could not be released. Perhaps you've heard it said that myths are rooted in fact. And so whether someone considers these stories to be mythical or not, there's sure a commonality among them. Some of the flood accounts have been seasoned with their own details, and heroes have been given preferable names to Noah and his wife. But after the details are stripped away, Bert Thompson noted that there's almost complete agreement on the main points of the accounts, and he lists them as follows. First of all, a universal destruction by water of the human race and all other living things occurred. Second of all, an ark or a boat was provided as the means of escape for some. Third, a seed of mankind was provided to perpetuate the human race. And Furman Curley summarized it well when he said, these traditions agree in too many vital points not to have originated in the same factual event. So there's traditions, uh, cultures that are sharing these stories. And they come back to that same historical beginning. Fossil evidence of a global flood. Let's talk about fossil evidence. Fascinating to me. It may seem that bone fossilization is a common occurrence. We see pictures all the time. You can... Look it up on the internet and say fossils, human fossils, or you'll see pictures. Um, we can go to museums and we see all kinds of, we think are bones, right? They're forms of those bones. Uh, we think it's a common occurrence since fossils of different land-dwelling animals may be found all over the world, but in fact, fossilization is very rare. It's very rare. Fossilization you may know, requires rapid burial in just the right conditions in order to preserve a carcass or a plant. The normal process of decay claims the vast majority of flesh and bone as it's exposed to carnivores, scavengers, insects, worms, even oxygen. You know, it just sits there. You know, you're driving Route 70 on the way here, you can see just about all of that. 
You know, there's the buzzers over here, and there's a smell in the air when you, you know, hit mile mark or whatever, and that's normally what happens. Those things are not being fossilized. It's on a regular occurrence. Evolutionary scientist James Powell wrote concerning this subject. Notice I said evolutionary leaning scientist, James Powell. He wrote, in the winter after the great Yellowstone fires of 1988, thousands of elk perished from extreme cold coupled with a lack of food. Thousands of elk perished. 1988. He says, late the following spring, their carcasses were strewn everywhere. Yet only a few years later, bones from the great elk kill are scarce. The odds that a single one will be preserved so that it can be found 65 million years from now approach zero. At best, we can expect to find fossil evidence of only a tiny fraction of the animals that once lived. The Earth's normal processes destroy or hide most of the clues. So we should not expect that there is this great record of fossils under, the, under your feet right now. We can just start digging. We're going to find all kinds of human bones, bones of things we've never seen, you know, animal bones, plant life from, from bygone eras. We shouldn't expect to find that. It is found in concentrated places. Here's how scarce they are. Human fossil remains, he says, are extremely scarce, making up an infinitesimal portion of the Earth's fossil record. In a 1981 article from the New Scientist, John Reeder wrote back then, he said, the entire hominid collection known today would barely cover a billiard table. Well, I've got books that if you put all the pages of the pictures together, it'd about cover this room. So we're... Where are they getting these? There's fractions and portions. We don't have that many. A lot of the pictures are the pictures of the same bone fragments is what it is. A year later, Lyle Watson in the same publication stated the fossils that decorate our family tree, so-called, are so scarce that all the physical evidence we have for human evolution can still be placed with room to spare inside a single coffin. These are in scientific journals. As for dinosaur bones, only about 2,100 articulated bones exist. That is, two or more aligned in the same position as when they were alive. And this may explain why we don't find many instances of human fossils in the same layer as dinosaur fossils. You know, where are those? Boy, we'd sure like to find them. Well, first of all, we have examples of that. The second of all, they're just rare, just scarce. You know, just go out and dig up a dinosaur bone very easy. I mean, certain places, places where perhaps water might leave them in a pool of residue as it drains. And that's what I believe we're going to see here. I'm going to spare you. There's some facts in the books. Uh, I'll spare you of some of these uh, decimals and percentages of, of the rarity of some of these fossils, but it is fascinating. And it's interesting to learn that evolutionists explain many of the largest dinosaur graveyards in the world where these fossils of dinosaurs are compacted, as having been caused by a flood. I mean, that's how they got there. You know, I, I explained this to my kids one day. I said, well, you know, when you come in from playing and you're really dirty, and you go take a bath, you know, if they haven't lately, they take showers, they're bigger now. But, you know, when your kids, you all pile in the tub after a day of play, and you take a bath, and you, you drain the water, and there's a ring and then it gets really scummy at the bottom. And then down around the drain, you only really look down there. You just kind of run the water again and rinse it all out. Right? Close your eyes and wipe up the dirt at the bottom. <laughs> My kids have gotten dirty. You know, it was when they were in West Virginia, those couple of years up on this hill, I think that that happened the most. But uh, it's the same idea that, you know, there's going to be a smattering of things left on different points as it recedes, as water might recede, but there's going to be a drain a catch basin, if you will. And these dinosaur graveyards, even the evolutionists are admitting, they seem to be caused by a flood and left there as if in the bottom of a bathtub when you drain the scum. And there they all are piled up in the bottom. But they would dare not say, dare not say, universal, global, biblical, noaic, catastrophe. No way. More like seasonal, flash, regional, and local. Let's talk for a moment about the geologic column. I believe I've got a few minutes left. The geologic column, you've probably seen pictures of it. 
here or there in your life. It's a hypothetical sequence of rock layers from the oldest rocks on earth to the youngest rocks on earth from bottom up. The oldest ones must be down here. The youngest ones must be. It makes sense to my mind, right? The most recent ones are on the top, of course. The geologic timetable, though, attached ages to these different rock layers. The rock layers are there. We can see those. And we understand that whatever happened most recently happened on the top. But when you attach this timetable to it and long eons of years to each layer, now you're getting into a different realm here. You're not in science anymore. You've left science. Now you're into philosophy. This has been acknowledged by a long, uh, for a long time. Geologist R.H. Rastel of Cambridge University conceded back in 1956. Imagine this. Just 1956. They're already conceding this. It cannot be denied that from a strictly philosophical standpoint, geologists are here arguing in a circle. How is that? The succession of organisms has been determined by a study of the remains embedded in the rocks, and the relative ages of the rocks are determined by the remains of the organisms they contain. In other words, modern geologists have been, or not even modern, for years geologists have been dating the fossils by the rocks, but then they'll date the rocks by the fossils. And that's circular reasoning, isn't it? Well, we know these to be this old because our geologic timetable says that if they're in this layer, they're this old. Well, how do you know the geologic timetable is accurate? Because we found fossils that we believe from evolutionary theory must be this old found in these layers. So they're this old. So the rocks are this old because the fossils that we find in them, the fossils are that old because they're found in that rock layer. And that's what we've been doing for years. And it's still in the books. Still in the books. And this is what we're fighting against. We're fighting against some stubbornness. There are many problems with the column. Let's just talk about a few. First of all, the rock layers aren't uniform at all. Much of the strata of the earth is out of order. No, it's not the same all around the earth where there's just, you got the topsoil on the top and the oldest rocks are at the bottom. It's not that way everywhere. They're fa in fact, they're inverted in some places. And in fact, the fossils are inverted in many places. But this is explained oftentimes by terms such as folding or faulting to where when those sediments were softened at one time or uh, perhaps a, a local volcanic activity moved certain things up over the top of other things and they folded over top like folding a sandwich over. And so you, know, you run into that where they're inverted. And so there's all kinds of explanations out there, but even worse, complex animals, which are supposed to be at the top, right? By evolutionary theory, the simplest forms at the bottom, the most complex at the top. These appear suddenly without any ancestors in the lowest rocks in the geologic column. And despite the evolutionist claims to the contrary, the fossils are not on their side. I've got an article I keep I study it with the high school students and middle school students. I don't think we get to them early enough sometimes, but I study it with elementary students. I've got an article from Time Magazine on the Cambrian explosion, and that's exactly what this is doing, is trying to explain that. We don't know how, but at some point in history, way down in the bottom of our beloved geologic column, there's an explosion of activity. It's like evolution just took off, and all this complex stuff occurred and we have the fossils of it here but just below it it's really I'd save them a lot of effort if they read Genesis chapter 6 I believe secondly the sedimentary rocks have been formed through a process of erosion transportation deposition and then hardening or lithification deposition is the means by which we believe the flood to have laid down the layers of sedimentation the flood that is laying down the letters of sedimentation Picture the bathtub, if you will, in your mind, followed by lithification. So if you put a bunch of different sediments in a bathtub and you drained it real slow, the tendency is as heavier, weightier matter, the matter is going to go down first, 
Then the lighter stuff will settle, right? On the top of that, and then lighter yet. And that's the proposal from the flood uh, model. He says there's evidence that this has happened on a massive scale in many places in the world. The Grand Canyon is one such place. And I was privileged to go this uh, May and see the Grand Canyon. Fabulous. The Colorado River, which runs through it, is not an adequate explanation for the grand size of the canyon. I'll quote Dr. Harib, who's with us this week in the lectures, where he said there are over 900 cubic miles of dirt missing from the end of the river. Now, when you look at the Mississippi River, which dumps about 300 million cubic miles, uh, yards of sediment into the Gulf of Mexico each year and we can see that out there as it's forming the Grand Canyon certainly we should be able to find the sediment that's washed out there the 900 cubic miles seems that the canyon was formed by a giant washout probably carried away deep into the Pacific settled down out there but one of the sharpest daggers to the heart of the geologic column is the presence of polystrate fossils. A polystrate fossil is a fossil that is straight, upright, and rises through several geologic layers of sedimentation, which are supposedly, we're to believe, laid down over long periods of time, right? except the fact that this tree in its entirety stretching through several layers of the sedimentation is fossilized and that can only happen with a rapid burial of the sediments around it to, to fossilize it or colify it. And so these polystrate fossils themselves ought to destroy the geologic column. But no, we carry on and we certainly don't see any of those in our public textbooks, polystrate fossils. I could talk of coal and oil formation and we could talk of racial distribution, the distribution of races throughout the earth. We could look at population statistics, anthropological arguments, erosion statistics, like we mentioned with the Grand Canyon and the Mississippi River, uh, the nature uh, and the layout of oce oceanic ridges and basins, volcanic and seismic up upheavals, all of these things we can look at, fossils and decay rates, uh, tectonic shifting, dating methods, all of these things we can look at to provide very satisfying results for those of us who believe in the integrity of the Bible. And when you look at it in light of the Genesis flood, I believe it makes a lot more sense. Somebody says to me, well, you were raised believing this, so you know, hey, no, when I was at Ohio University and this stuff was being thrown in my face uh, in my big 400-person freshman classes, I had to go back and start asking questions. And when I asked those questions, I asked them in an unbiased fashion. And when I read, I read with an open mind. And that's why I'm here today. I've come down on one side of this argument. And so in view of the above facts, we conclude that the theory of uniformitarianism, which claims the understanding that the present is the key to the past, would not even been in operation during the last two periods of Earth history, the creation and the flood. Therefore, the Bible and not the present is the key to the past. And I'd suggest to the skeptic before he dismisses the biblical literal viewpoint as unworthy of notice, just waves the hand that he give it a more careful and unbiased analysis. He'll find, first of all, that the Bible teaches a catastrophic global flood. Secondly, that it states in no uncertain terms that it destroyed every living thing which moved on the earth, including every human except for Noah and his family and a representative pair or pairs of each kind of animal. And third, if he is honest in his inquiry, and is true to both the Bible and the science of geology, the major facts of geology and other scientists, sciences can be satisfactorily fitted within this framework. The Genesis account poses no threat to the facts of science, to the facts of science, nor does it pose a threat to the credibility of the Bible, nor to your faith or mine. But it does stand as a formidable obstacle to the acceptance of the geologic timetable and the evolutionary biologist. Affirmation of the one definitely denies the credibility of the other. Which interpretation of history is accepted as the most plausible has a direct bearing on the mind of man, the happiness of man, and the destiny of man. Man will stand or fall with their acceptance or rejection of the credibility of the Bible. The souls are at stake. Many 
may these and uh, other evidence that, that can be provided, it's my prayer that these will provide an immovable foundation stone for you, for anyone who's listening. We need to stand shamelessly with the Bible. Whenever you do that, you will never be ashamed. God has told you that, that you shall not be ashamed when you call upon his name, and you shall not be ashamed when you call upon his book. So let's stand with him and remember the warning of the Lord as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man, except it'll be fire next time. Thank you.